Creating intersections between rectangles is slightly more complex than doing circle-based collision, but it opens up more opportunities and in many ways will be more useful long-term. So looking in the rectangle intersect function, we're deploying it similar to what we did with circle intersect where we created a function that returns a boolean. So we ask, are these two objects intersecting? If so, it's just going to fill the background with a transparent yellow color. So when I look at what's happening, rectangle one, rectangle two, one is the enemy, one is sprite. When they intersect, when they are touching each other or overlapping, we can see how the background turns yellow. To dissect what is going on, we'll just take a quick look at the enemy. It's just simply x, y width and height, and it draws it in a fixed location. Sprite is drawing it based on where the mouse is for the X and Y, so it's updating its position to the mouse. So Sprite is the red box, enemy is the blue box. The way that intersect works is we need to know the width, the height, and X and Y location of each of our objects. So we pass in two objects, very much like what we did with circle collisions, but this time we don't care about a radius value, we care about width and height. And what we need to do is determine how far apart the two objects are on both the x-axis and the y-axis. So we find the distance apart on the x-axis. So that is going to be the x position of the object plus half of its width. Now the reason we have to add in half of the width is when we draw a rectangle at x and y, it's drawing it from, as we can see with the sprite here, from the top left corner. That's where the mouse is. That's our x value. We need to now move to the center. We need to know how far apart the two centers of the objects are. How far apart are they on the x-axis, the distance between their two x centers, and the distance on the y-axis. And this allows us to then go by the center of the objects, and our objects don't have to be square. They could be rectangles. They could be tall, skinny. They could be short and fat, long and narrow. It doesn't matter what proportion they are. In this case, they're all just being drawn at the same size. But if we change that, so instead of having that, we could have width of 10 and the rectangle collision still works on all four edges. So we test it coming in from any direction and we can see how it still works. So it doesn't matter what shape or proportion the objects are. If we make them both long skinny, this is the beauty of using the rectangle based collision. So we figure out how far apart are they from their x's, how far apart are their y's. So this is now determining essentially where, what is the distance between the two centers of the objects. Then what we need to know is how big is half of the width of the first object plus half of the width of the second object. And then we also combine half heights. And we're using this because we're now measuring from the center and then we have to know these distances because then we will calculate the distance x and if that distance on their x's is less than half of their, the combined half widths. So this is essentially now the same thing we did with the radius where we said we take the radius of the two objects and is that sum greater or less than the distance between the two centers? But because we're not doing circles, we have to do this calculation twice. So we have to do it both for widths and height values. And if the distance between their x's and their combined half widths turns out to be true, then if the distance between their y's and their combined half heights is less, then that means 
they are intersecting and this boolean will return true otherwise return false now remember if we say return inside a function that now kicks us out of the function returns that value so then we never get around to returning the second return statement so that's how returns work once you go through a function and it says return that exits that function and returns whatever that value is. That's the beauty of a return statement. Now, working with this, we're going to have to add in a few things because we're not going to do animated images just yet, but we'll just do some standalone images here so that we have access to it. So I'm going to create two new variables first, and they will be of p image type, and the first one will be sprite image, and the second is going to be my enemy image. Now with these we just have to populate those values, and to do that I can just say sprite image equals load image and I need to specify where that image is. Now that image is in a folder called data and my sprite image will be face 0001.png and quotes and my enemy image it's going to be a load image again in the data folder and this will be unicorn 0001.png so now I have image files that are going to be accessible to my enemy and sprite classes so that I can draw these objects on screen Going into the enemy class, inside the enemy class, we will populate this out a little bit. We'll set our x and y width and height as well as put in um, some other things that we need with it and we'll set up the display. We're not going to care too much about the update just yet. We're just going to put the objects on screen and then we will start getting things moving. So we're building it up in pieces here. So x for the enemy will be a random value and it's going to be somewhere between 100 and the width of our sketch, the sketch minus 100. So then that puts it somewhere on the screen but 100 pixels from either border. The y is going to follow the same process. It will be at a random value but it will be with the height minus 100 as a option and then finally we get to use display and under display this is where we will specify I want to show an image and the image I want to show is my enemy image and I will put it at my X and Y positions so again, we're not caring about update just yet. We just want to put the enemy image in with its display method so that we now are able to draw that picture on screen. We want to verify everything is working. We can now specify I want to display my enemy image and run my sketch. I uh, forgot one minor little thing. We need to actually instantiate these objects. I got null pointer or exception, so I told my enemy to display. Enemy's never been defined. If something is not defined and you try to access it, that is when you get the null error message. So E is going to be equal to a new enemy. 
and we'll set s is going to be equal to a new sprite. So we'll just populate those two options in there as well so that they now exist. And now running it. I can see the enemy randomly populated on screen and it will keep randomly populating for us. So we've proven it works. He's showing up time to work on the sprite just a little bit so that we have the sprite there. With this, we will set the X for the sprite equal to width divided by two. Y is going to be equal to height divided by two, so it puts it up on the middle of the screen, approximately. It's going to look pretty close to the middle. I mean, if we modified it by adjusting by the width and height of the object, if we cared about that, then we could take care of that. But we're not going to do that just yet. And then under display, we'll just call the image. And we, it's our sprite image at the X and Y coordinates. So very much like what we did with the enemy, we're telling an image to display. This is the image we're telling to display and this is the location that we want it to show up on screen. Going back into the main program We tell the sprite to display, and we can see that it shows up in the middle of the screen. So we're off to a good start. To get the player sprite moving based on keyboard input, we'll see we have some key pressed and key released functions here, and we will take a look at using those and how we might want to go about doing it. But before I do that, I'm going to look at how we could do it badly. Now, when I look at my sprite here, it has X and Y values associated with it. What we don't want to do is to be directly affecting that inside of our key pressed methods or functions. So we don't want to do that. We want to just press these and then have the respective objects that care about it do something with it. Otherwise, what we could do is under key pressed, we could say if, and you will see where we have this word key code in here. And what this allows us to do is with the key code, we can now track which key was pressed on the keyboard. Every key has a numeric value associated with it. So the left key has a numeric value or an ASCII <coughs> key code, ASCII -I key code of 37. So what we can do is say if, if our key code is equal to 37, E dot X plus equals, I'll just do one. So 37 is the left key. So if I run my sketch here, if I press the left key, oh, I wanted to do my sprite and I'm going to go up bigger. Now, if I press the left key, I don't actually want my X to get bigger. I want my X to get smaller, so I should have used a minus there. So I messed up on a number of things. Now, if I press the left arrow key, we'll see where we get this very non-smooth, kind of jerky movement. Now, watching again from the middle, if I press and hold down the key, what you'll notice is it jumps once, and then it starts jumping a bunch of times after that. So if I press the key, so you'll see where we have this little jump 
can pause and then it starts stepping out. And that problem is related to the fact that the movement is happening based on registering the key repeat rate because if I press this key it registers the first time and then it pauses and then it registers again so when you press a key down on your keyboard it doesn't immediately start repeating it has that little pause so if you have slow fingers when you're typing you don't get double and triple versions of the letter that you press the key down on so it's based on that key repeat rate so if I set my key repeat rate to be really, really slow, then this stepping that we see there would slow down even worse. And it would be super ugly instead of just mostly ugly. But we don't want that kind of movement. We want smoother movement. So what we don't do is we don't modify the property based on pressing the key or releasing the key. But instead what we want to do is we just want to have the program notify us hey, you press the left key, or you press the right key, or up or down. And we're using a modified version of an if statement. This is an if-else statement, but instead of using that, we are using what's called switch. When we have things that are these repeating groups like this, it works better and is easier to read in the code if we use the switch statement versus if-else. But I could do the same thing if I said if, and we'll do a return here, else if, like this, and put this in here, and then key code is equal to 37. Now if you notice the keys, left is 37, up is 38, right is 39, down is 40. If you look at the four arrow keys on your keyboard, you will see that that's going clockwise around the arrow keys. Left, up, right, down. So that's how those, that number sequence works. So as long as you remember you go in a circle like that, starting with the left arrow key at 37, you can find all of the numbers. And this second one would be if the key code is equal to, it could just go around. I always like to do left and right together, then up and down, so that's why I go 37, 39, then 38, 40. And just going to speed up here and copy it. So this if block here, if the key code is 37, left is true, else if the key code is 39, right is true, else if the key code is 38, up is true, else if the key code is 40, down is true. That's the same as using this switch statement, which does, on the case that 37 is true, then we'll set left is equal to true, right. So these are equivalent ways of writing. Now some of you may say, okay, I like my if else if because I'm familiar and comfortable with that, that's great. But it's also important to understand that there are other programming constructs that we need to know of which one of those is the switch statement. So it is important to learn about it. Switch also has one other important thing is once, if we say that the case was 27, so it was the left key I pressed, we set left as true, we have to exit out of the switch statement by using a break statement, otherwise it will just keep going down the list and even though if I press left, if there were no breaks in here, it would register 40 because then it, would, it just keeps going down and said, yeah, I found something's true, we're good. You're like, no, but that's not the one I wanted. So switch statements do require you to remember to use the word break. That's the one gotcha when you're writing switches. Also notice it uses colons. There's no curly braces. So I find that switch statements on something like tracking key codes are easier to read because all my indents lined up better. I don't have one line with if, the others are else if. 
your mileage will vary. You can decide what works for you. Both of these are fine and correct to use. Now, if we are doing it like this, this now spits out which key was pressed, but you will notice nowhere in here did my code tell the sprite what to do. Because we just want to broadcast out this message that left, right, up, or down are true. And once we've done that, we can see that left, right, up, and down are available inside my program. So now, with that, I can go into my sprite and do something with this inside the sprite class. One thing to keep in mind on this, this registers 60 times a second, or the frame rate of what my program is running at. So when my program's running, I press a key, it registers that it's true. One frame later, if I press another key, even though if I think I press them at the same time, I'm not fast enough to press two keys separate or, you know, within less than a 60th of a second. I can't physically do that. One will always take precedence over the other, and it will key that one on frame one. It will key the next one on frame two. Now I could potentially have two, three, or four keys all being pressed simultaneously, and they will now all register as true. As I release any of those keys, my release is going to be a mirror image of my press, but it's going to set those Boolean values to false. Now, right now, this is tracking four keys. I can track as many keys as I want. So I could maybe use space to jump. I could use space to shoot. I could use shift to jump or shoot. So I could program in whatever keys I want. I could also program in WASAD as my movement instead of arrow keys. I would just have to change which key code I'm looking for. And then I could set that up. So we can have multiple keys pressed simultaneously and we need to take that into account because when we're trying to move the player through keyboard, if I'm pressing left and right at the same time, which direction should it go? Which one will take precedence? Or if I'm pressing both, maybe I say, you don't get to move because you're indecisive and I lock out the movement. That is entirely permissible as well. Into the sprite. Sprite has Vx and Vy, that's our velocity x and velocity y. When the sprite starts out, Vx is going to be equal to zero, Vy is going to be equal to zero. So now the sprite is not moving. I will go into my update and say x is plus equals Vx, y is going to have a plus equal Vy. Now that takes care of our base movement. Now we need to figure out how we can update or change or modify Vx and Vy. Now the easy way we can do that is I simply say if left, now remember we know left comes from when we press a key we set left as true. When we release a key we set left back equal to false. Same thing for right, up, and down. Now oh, let me just comment that out. I don't want any weirdness happening. So back here, so if left is true, Vx is going to be equal to, we'll just say negative five. Now if I run my program, hit the left arrow, we can see nothing is happening. I've added to my update function. Now if I go into my draw, if I tell my sprite to update, and now run my program and press the left key, we can see now, oh shoot, and it's gone. Let's try that again. If I press the left key, if I just tap it, Okay, it's still going. So what we see happening is the update, if left is true, the Vx is negative five. But we never are resetting 
met. Now if I were to say if not left vx is equal to zero. Now if we run this we'll see I can press the left key and it goes and stops. The other keys aren't doing much but it's doing something and it's doing it much better than when we just put it in the key pressed or key released. So that is going to give us a better option. Going left is great. I wish I could go right as well. So we'll say if right vx is equal to 5. And now if not right vx equal to zero. Let's see how this works. I run this, I press left. Oh wait. Uh oh. Wait. I'm getting some weirdness going on here. So I have to hold right to go left or I have to hold left to go right. So we got got some got some issues here that we have to work through the logic of what is happening. So if I press left, I want my VX to go one way. If I press right, I want it to go the other way. So that makes sense. But what we do need to do is we need to handle when I'm not pressing them a little bit differently. And there's a couple of ways that we can go about doing this. So it's not working quite right on the knots because then I have to be pressing one and pressing a different one and then it's, it depends on which one I pressed first and it's just a mess and it's not working really well. So I'm going to just nuke those out of there. We'll come up with a slightly different solution. So realistically, if I'm pressing left, that means I'm not pressing right. So if I press left and not right, or if I press right and not left, now this allows us to move without, because if we're pressing both buttons, that just doesn't make sense. Because we can't be going left and right at the same time. That would split our player in half and it would just cause a uh, rip in the space-time continuum and it would just be bad. So we don't want that. But if I'm pressing left, I'm not pressing right. If I'm pressing right, I'm not pressing left. That makes sense. And my third option here is if I'm not pressing left and I'm not pressing right, we want something to happen. But before I fill that in, I wanted to see what this looks like with the first fix. So if I run this, if I press left, it starts going left. If I press right, it goes. So we can see where I can play a little game of Pong with myself. That's kind of fun. Just bouncing back and forth, pressing left and right. But I can't stop moving. And that's where if I'm not pressing left and I'm not pressing right, we'll set the VX equal to zero. So now if I run it, we can see how we're able to go back and forth across the screen. So this sets us up for left and right, and it sets it up for not left and not right. The next step is to repeat this process for up and down. So left became up, right became down, vx became vy, so now we can move up. Because when I press up, I'm using a negative value. When I press down, I'm using a positive value for my vy movement component. And now we can move up and down, and I can go left and right. But I can also go diagonal because there is nothing that is precluding us from having 
an up and a left or an up and a right because those are not contradictory movements. Up and down are contradictory and left and right are contradictory. So we can't have both of those at the same time. To add some excitement to this, we want the enemy to start following the player around on the screen and figure out where they are. The way that we accomplish this is when we call update on the enemy, we want the enemy to know where the player is so it knows what destination point it's aiming for. So we'll see the update method is looking for two values, the sprite x and the sprite y. So if, after updating the sprite, I update my enemy, I need to pass in two values, and I will pass in a s.x and an s.y. So I'm passing in the sprites x and y values when I call that update method. So now we need to figure out how to use that information. So that allows us to tell the enemy, hey, this is where the sprite currently is. That's where you need to go to. So the enemy now gets to do something. And what it gets to do is to figure out how to chase the player. So we have to determine on this. First we want to know what is the gap on the x-axis and what is the gap on the y-axis between the two entities. So what is the gap? Like in this iteration right now, there's a larger gap on the x-axis and a small gap on the y-axis because they're almost aligned. So their distance y is pretty small. Their distance x is pretty big. So we need to figure out what gap exists and then we're going to modify so that the enemy is going to close the larger gap first each time. That gives us a better, now you can modify it but then you'll get some weird options. Now this also means it's moving either in a horizontal or a vertical manner if the position is just right, it will appear to be going diagonal, but what it's doing is it's alternating between I close the gap horizontal, then I close the gap vertical, then I close the gap horizontal, close the gap vertical, and it stair steps its way over. We are not doing where the objects are rotating and pointing at each other and following that. We will look at doing rotational movement in a subsequent session, and that allows us to have a different type and style of movement on screen, but right now we are doing simply horizontal or vertical movements with what is occurring. So first we need to find out if the distance between the x of the enemy minus the x of the sprite is less than the distance of the enemy's y minus the sprite's y. Now the ABS in there, what that says is I want to know the number difference between these. So if the x is, if the enemy's x is a smaller number than the sprite's x, but they're far apart. So if let's say the enemy is at 10 and the sprite is at 300, that means there are x distances negative 390. But I care about that 390 part. I don't care about the negative part. Absolute or ABS says, I just want to know the actual value. I don't care whether it's a positive or negative. I want to know the number component. So if I have minus 3 and 2, but I take the absolute value of minus 3, the absolute value of minus 3 is 3, so the absolute value of minus 3 is going to be bigger than the value of 2 because it's the number component. So ABS, when you see that, just says, if there's a negative, throw it away. And then just go with the number. This allows us to do subtraction to find true distances and then not care. So then we don't have to say, well, if it's bigger 
if the SX is bigger than X, then subtract SX first. It's like, no, we don't care about it. Just subtract the two, throw away the minus, if there is a minus. If there isn't a minus, it doesn't matter either. So that's what ABS does. So if the distance on the x-axis is less than the distance on the y-axis, that means we have a bigger gap on y-axis. Then what we have to do is find out, is the enemy to the left or the right of the player? And we do that by comparing their y values. So if the y of the enemy is less than the player's y, so that means if the y is less than the player's y, that means the enemy is above player. So if the enemy is above player, well, we know that we're moving on the y-axis right now, so vx will be 0. But our vy, so if the enemy is above the player, we need to make it go down so we add 2 to the vy so it starts going down the screen. Else the enemy is below player so that means vx once again is going to be 0 but vy needs to be a negative value to make the enemy start going up. So again, so if the gap is bigger on the y-axis, then we're going to start closing that gap. So we always want to be closing the larger of the two gaps. So now this, depending on where the player is, it's going to try and close that gap, which I suppose we could try and run it and let's see what happens if I move the player. Oh, but it's not going to do anything yet because even though we set Vx and Vy, we never actually use them. Oh. X doesn't get a Y value, it gets X added. X plus equal Vx, Y plus equal Vy. Now if I run it, you can see where, and you can see how it's following, wait. So now we get a little ping pong effect. It's able to follow us and chase us now that we've instituted the x plus vx, y plus equals vy, so now that's working there. Now if we go back into our previous part here, so if as we follow it the gap was bigger on the y-axis, we close that, but if the gap isn't bigger on the y-axis, that means the gap is bigger on the x-axis, so we need to close that. So this means the bigger gap on x-axis. So we need to start closing it. So it's going to be a repeat of what we just did. If x is less than sx, then what we need to do is say vx. vx is going to be, so if the x is less than the sprite's x, that means Vx is going to be positive because we need to move to the right. Vy will be equal to 0. Oh, let's just put comment in here. When doing this chase methodology, I find using comments really does help you to remember what gap you're trying to close and how you're trying to close it. So the enemy is left of player. Else enemy is right of player. Vx would then be equal to negative 2 because I want to go back in the other direction. Vy is going to be equal to 0. So now we're able to start closing those gaps. 
I mean, the third option here would be where we wouldn't want to be chasing the player, and we will talk about that where we may want to modify it so it's not always going after where the player is. We can see now it's going, and we're going to the two top left corners of our objects because we drew each of these as a rectangle in their top left corners, so that's the registration point they're using for this alignment. So we may want to shift where we draw the graphics just to better understand that. To help visualize that a little bit more, I am going to add two things in. I'm going to just set a fill color of same on the enemy, so I'll use fill color of green, transparent green. And I'll draw a rect at x comma. And I need the width and the height, which I haven't entered in yet for my enemy. So the width and height of the enemy, my width is going to be, in this case, equal to the pixel dimensions of the graphic is 140. The height is going to be equal to 95. So if I draw a rectangle at width and height, we'll see there's the rectangle that encloses it. And you can kind of see how that's overlapping with the existing sprite. Now, if the sprite moves, it's chasing after it. So you can see how it's trying to close that gap. And when it does, it lines up and then their two bounding boxes are overlapping. A bounding box in for the sprite. The width on the sprite is equal to 32, and the height on the sprite is equal to 32. If I go in display and choose fill, and just fill it with a transparent yellow. Anytime you're working with graphics, it's a good idea to draw the bounding box so you can visualize it on screen. It helps you to better understand when you are measuring collisions and detections because you'll realize to make this work more effectively, we want to modify this rectangle bounding box so that we get a little different arrangement. So we can see the two boxes and how it is indeed overlapping, but we need to maybe think about shrinking the box on the unicorn because it doesn't make sense to have the empty space above it like this. Its tail is probably not toxic as well, so we could shrink that out of it. Where the box for the player, or the sprite, is because the artwork mostly fills it, it works more effectively to use a rectangle collision. But if we had more of a standard rectangle just for the main body and legs of the unicorn that would give us a little better collision option and alignment while we are trying to put things on screen. So we will look at that in a little while. But that's not a difficult one to uh, add to the mix. Also notice that the unicorn is very skilled at walking backwards as well as walking forward so we may want to come up with a strategy to flip that so that we can handle it in both directions as we're working with it and you may notice that we have some ideas already prepped into the code to take that into account. I'm going to make one change to the base code that you started with where it says frames we're going to change this to sprite frames because that makes it more clear. We have enemy frames and sprite frames. These are two values that correspond to the number of frames that we have for each one. So if I look at that, I would have sprite frames. It's going to be equal to 23. And enemy frames will be equal to 6. Oh, I need an S there. Now what we are going to do is populate these 
sprite images or enemy images arrays. We'll start out with the sprite images first and work with that and we'll populate it. Currently we just have a single one. Now we're going to modify it so we can have a series or a group of images that we are using and when we have that whole group of images we'll load them once and then we can specify which image in that array of images we want to show on screen. So the way that we accomplish that is sprite images it's going to be equal to new new array of p images so we use p image and now the size of that array is the number of sprites that go into it which is sprite frames by storing sprite frames in a variable that allows us to not hard code the number into it so if we were to change the animation around later we would just change that number once and it would not break the rest of our code. Now we use a for loop and with this so it's just like loading separate enemies or drops as we used before this time we're loading images. So int i is going to be equal to 0 i is going to be less than sprite frames i plus plus parenthesis curly twice up arrow now sprite images bracket i just remember arrays always start counting at zero that's why we set i is equal to zero sprite images i is equal to load image and now we have to specify the image we wish to load and the image that we're trying to load we have a pattern going on in the naming here this pattern has a series of numbers on it now if our numbers were set up where they were just one through nine it would be really easy because then we could just say if the name would specify the name and path so then I would go data slash and now I would specify the name face like this and if it was just one through nine I could you know go plus you know I like that and if we started at zero it'd be even better face zero plus PNG like this and that would be fantastic if we could do it that way unfortunately we can't because we have more than a single uh, number so it's like 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 9, and then 0, 0, 1, 0. so that breaks the pattern so we have to learn how to format i so that it takes on the correct number of zeros now all of these zeros were generated in here in the naming because these frames were exported then from Adobe Animate so I built a simple little animated sequence in Animate said export it out as a series of images it spits out the images automatically numbered them for me so I didn't have to manually do it so I don't have a great number sequence on it otherwise if it was you know through nine it'd just be zero 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 and then add in my number but I don't get that so what we're able to do is to combine it with a really cool feature that is built into a lot of programming languages and that is the way to format a number where I can format a number with however many kind of extra zeros onto it as I want and we do that by saying NF for number format and then I'm going to specify what I want to format and how many zeros I want on it so I say number format and I'm going to say I plus one well, this means that our first number will come out as i, or I mean as 1, but it will be four numbers long, and any of those extra numbers it will populate with a 0. Now, just to verify this is working, we can print this out, and I can just print out sprite images to see how this works.
and you can see we have a small problem here and that it says that file is missing or inaccessible and if I look I'm trying to recreate phase zero zero and I realized I forgot to put the dot in front of the PNG. So now let's repeat that again. And if I look at what printed out, you know, it printed out full names on it. So I don't, that's not quite how I want it to print out. So we'll have to change what I'm printing out in a moment here. It's stored in our array of sprite images. Now Sprite needs to do something with those images. For Sprite to do something with those images, Sprite needs to then set a value. We have to set our current frame equal to zero. That's what frame we're going to start on. So we make our current frame zero. And this would be a display feature. So instead of displaying Sprite image, we want to display a frame of the sprite image. So if I were to just change this and say zero like this, oh, and it's sprite images then. Sprite images, show me frame zero. If I run it, it shows me frame zero. Now let's see, if we look at frame, I'll say, show me 17. No, not 117. That won't work. Now we can see it's a different piece of artwork. So it's showing me a different image. So we want to be able to cycle through those frames. So instead if I just say, hey, show me the current frame, now we just need to update that current frame. And to update the current frame, we can say current frame Let's just go plus plus and see what happens. So then it goes up. Now if I run it, oh, okay, let's watch that again. If I run, we see it and it goes through an animation and then it gets to number 23, which means that's asking for the 24th element in my array, which only has 23 items in it. So if I ask for something that doesn't exist, I get the array out, index out of bounds exception, and it's telling me where it happened. So I can't just keep adding to current frame forever. I need to say if current frame is less than sprite frames. No, that's, that's not what it is. Oh yeah, it is sprite frames. Okay. So if current frame is less than sprite frames, the number of frames that are in my item, then it's current frame you go up by one, else current frame is going to be equal to zero. So we effectively reset it. There is a shorthand way of writing this we'll look at down the road, but right now, so if the current frame is less than the total number of frames, we add to it. Otherwise, we reset it. Now, if we run this, Try again. There we go. Sorry for the I'll mix up on it. So update the current frame. If the current frame is equal to the total number of frames, we reset it back to zero. Now when it runs, you can see how it goes into a permanent loop. Now we can repeat that same process with the enemy sprite with the evil unicorn where you could now take this 
Same stuff with current frame, but it would be enemy frames. Don't forget to give current frame a starting value of zero. And then populate the enemy array as well, the same way that we have done it here. And then we will see both sprites animating. So Unicorn has the same four numbers on it. There's no capital in it. That's the .png. This would then be enemy images, enemy frames. So that populates that. Uh, we need to also make enemy images is equal to new the image. And that would be enemy frames so this would populate the enemy array with the enemy artwork and then it's a simple matter of going into the enemy class and adding in what is necessary to animate it which would be identical to what is inside the sprite class So change in the enemy class to enemy images instead of just showing an enemy image popular with current frame. Then if current frame is less than enemy frames, so now we can see how we have when there's more frames in animation, the loop appears smaller like the blinking eye because there's very few frames of animation with the unicorn. It has the very rapid movement on its legs.